This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. We are TheStreet.com. The sweet spot? The S&P at a new high. The Fed is on hold. Rates are low. Inflation even lower. And gas prices are falling. Does this create the perfect market condition? And for how long? But job engine sputters, unemployment falls, hiring slows as investors. Digest the first big economic report since the shutdown. What, if anything, could jumpstart the jobs market? And a surprising message. It's not often you hear the CEO of one of the year's best performing stocks warn of euphoria. But is the boss at Netflix doing the right thing by trying to play down the rising stock price? We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, October 22nd. Good evening, everyone. Bad or at least lackluster news for the economy was greeted as good news on Wall Street today. Stocks rose sharply with the S&P 500 setting yet another all-time closing high despite a disappointing September jobs report. That's because investors see those employment numbers as not strong enough to force the Federal Reserve to interrupt its bond buying program or weak enough to suggest economic gloom and doom. In short, what used to be called a Goldilocks scenario once upon a time. Of course, the story didn't end too well for Goldie. Bears arrived. But today, it was all nice porridge. Here's a look at the numbers. The Dow added 76 points, and it get a one-month high. The Nasdaq touching another 13-year, adding nine points on the day. And the S&P 500 was up 10 to finish at a new record close for the fourth consecutive session. Well, as Tyler just said, the September jobs report was a big disappointment. First of all, the report came 18 days late because of the government shutdown. And then the news was pretty lousy. American businesses added only 148,000 jobs. That was much less than expected, but enough to lower the nation's unemployment rate one notch to 7.2 percent. Hampton Pearson takes a closer look at one encouraging piece of the weak job market. In Baltimore, Gary Day's American limousine business is bucking the trend of a sluggish economy with slowing job growth. He's hiring workers because business is up. Good morning, American Limousines. How can I help you? In business for more than 20 years, Day says his customers tell him they're willing to spend money on an occasional luxury to offset all the belt tightening they're enduring. I think people feel a little more at ease and are starting to live again. They've been trapped in their homes and they're tightening their budgets for so long that they're starting to have fun again. With 45 full and part-time employees, Day is hiring not just drivers, but salespeople as well. Among the new hires, 22-year-old Carl Rogers. Rogers spent much of the last year in and out of government job training programs trying to improve his education and technology skills before getting the job offer last month. It's my first call. American Limousine, they called me back, so got the job and I was excited. Yeah, I feel good. I'm making some money, get to uh, provide for my family, so it's nice. Rogers is among just 126,000 new hires in the private sector in September, part of a job growth picture that even top White House officials admit will be impacted in the coming months by the hangover from the government shutdown and more future mandatory budget cuts on the horizon. There's no question that we'd like to see private sector job growth strengthening at a time like this. And there's no question that things like sequester, brinksmanship, all of that getting in the way of that happening. As for the Federal Reserve, leading economists say today's weak jobs data pushes back even further the timetable for tapering from Ben Bernanke and his fellow monetary policymakers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. But the White House economic advisor did warn today that the government shutdown means that about 120,000 fewer jobs were created in October. Some good news about gas prices. According to AAA, gasoline can now be found for less than $3 a gallon in parts of 24 states. Everywhere from Massachusetts and New Jersey in the east all the way west to Arizona and Colorado. The lowest prices AAA found at some Missouri warehouse club outlets was just $2.66 a gallon. Some experts now predict a nationwide average of $3.15 a gallon by Christmas, thanks to falling crude oil prices, refineries at top capacity, and declining demand.
By spending less to fill up the tank, consumers might have more money for holiday gifts. A new holiday survey from auditing firm Deloitte says the average American shopper will spend $421. That's up 9 percent from last year. And the firm also says that for the first time ever, people are planning to buy gifts online rather than at discount stores. Well, joining us now to talk more about their outlook for the economy and the financial markets, Melaine Mulrain, economist at TD Securities, and Kate Warren, investment strategist at Edward Jones. Welcome to uh, both of you. Uh, Melaine, let me start with you. This jobs report today caught some people by surprise in its weakness. What do you expect for the job market over the next, say, six months? Well, I think at least over the next three months or so, one can expect a significant slowing as the fallout from the government uh, shutdown and the uncertainty about the debt ceiling continue to wreak some havoc on, on business confidence and business hiring and investment decision. Uh, but I, I think once we move beyond December and January, if we get the political stalemate resolved with this conference committee that has been set and mandated to, to come to an agreement by December, I think it, it, the fundamentals are in place for us to have a sustained push higher, which is unlike what we've seen over the last uh, two or three years. The fiscal uncertainty has continued to stifle this economic recovery and has ensured that we haven't been able to sustain a higher push in employment growth or economic mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, let me get you in on this conversation, because it's pretty amazing what's going on in the stock market, even though the economy is not growing a much. You know, the way it usually used to work was the economy would pick up and grow, and then the stocks would go up. Now stocks are going up, even though the economy is weak. Are these high record highs justified? I think they are. We've uh, seen, obviously, four record highs in a row. And historically, when stocks have reached new record highs, like they just did, We've continued to see stocks move higher. They need to be supported by economic growth and by job growth. But keep in mind that we've seen an average growth rate for the economy of just 2 percent per year for the last four years. And that's been sufficient to support higher stock prices over that four and a half year period. I think we'll continue to see more of the same. The economy looks like it's stuck in sort of first gear, more of 2 percent growth, certainly hindered by uncertainty. But it's strong enough that it should support continued high stock prices. You know, Kate, Mullane and a lot of other people that we've been talking to seem to, uh, seem to think that all of the hesitation and the uh, policy by lurching from crisis to crisis is fundamentally a tax on our economy, a tax on growth, because it restrains business leaders, it restrains consumers. Do you see it that way? And how much is it really hurting the economy and hurting, for example, job growth? I think it's hurting the economy in two ways. It's not just, and I wouldn't quite call it an attack. I don't, I think it's undermining no, confidence. No, attacks, attacks. No, I think it's undermining confidence, and that does reduce hiring. It does reduce uh, overall economic growth. But there's a second way, which is the cutbacks in government spending, as well as the higher taxes that all of us started paying this year, are actually reducing overall economic growth by about 1 percent right now. So the private sector, even though it didn't hire very much in September, is growing closer to 3 percent. So I think there's two ways. We'd see even stronger private sector growth if we weren't mm -hmm. constantly being worried about what the government would do next and whether rules and regulations would keep changing. So I think it's as much the rules and regulations changing as it is the other things that you've already talked mm -hmm. about. What do you think, Mullane? What is it going to take to get this economy really growing again? And you just heard that uh, Deloitte survey that consumer spending is supposed to be up something like 9 percent this holiday season. What kind of shape is the consumer really in uh, to be a driver for this uh, economy? Well, you'll be surprised if I tell you the consumers are in their best shape. They've been uh, in about five or six years. Uh, for the simple reason, if you look at the household balance sheet, they are far better than they were uh, two, three years ago. And what we've seen over the past year is uh, higher home prices and higher equity prices. Uh, whether or not you want to question whether the sustainability of that, they have pushed consumer household wealth uh, to, to close to record high levels. And that will underpin some improvement in spending that we expect uh, this holiday season. Uh, I think 9 percent might be a bit toppish, but somewhere closer to 5 or 6 percent would clearly be justified by the fundamentals that we've seen and the improvement in those fundamentals over the past year or so. Kate, are stocks cheap or not? Uh, stocks aren't cheap, but they also aren't expensive. Stock uh, price earnings ratios for the S&P 500 are about in line with their average level for the past, since 1980, for the past few years. So now, you're comfortable you may think, buying? You'd yes, be comfortable I'm comfortable buying. buying. And the reason I was going to say that is 
But average doesn't sound too good. But historically, if price earnings ratios have been average, the return over the next year has been about nine and a half percent. So that says, yes, stocks look like the best choice for many investors at this time. So are you saying time to get definitely time to get out of bonds right now? No, I'm not saying time to get out of bonds. I think that most investors have, sitting on the sidelines should be putting money to work in both stocks and bonds. But I think stocks have the edge because we're likely to continue to see uh, a moderate economic growth. I think we could see a catalyst from the rest of the world as Europe and Japan pick up. And that says stocks are likely to outperform. People need to own bonds because remember stocks pull back periodically and bonds help buffer portfolios. Malayne, very quickly, 2014, what is your growth forecast for the U.S. economy right now on October 22nd? Well, we have a fairly constructive view on the growth projection for 2014, and I think we are likely to see another year of two halves. The first half driven by political uncertainty, and if we do get that political uncertainty resolved, we, we think we would be in the clear for the economic recovery. And you can see growth of 3 percent plus. Uh, beyond the, the first half of, of next year, and, mm -hmm. and, and that can push higher to 4 percent in 2015, which would bring the Fed back into play. That's pretty nice. 3 percent next year, 4 percent the year after. Folks, thank you very much. Melaine Mulrain, economist at TD Securities, and Kate Warren, investment strategist at Edward Jones. The S&P 500 index isn't the only measure at an all-time high right now. So is CEO pay. In fact, in its first ever survey of the highest paid CEOs, a company called GMI Ratings finds some top executives aren't just making millions, some are making billions. Mary Thompson has more on which CEOs have the biggest paychecks. It's a lot to like. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg taking home $2.3 billion in pay last year, making him GMI Ratings' highest-paid CEO for 2012. Pay for Zuckerberg and others driven by two key factors. It's the stock price and the uh, number of stock options that these individuals are getting. When Facebook went public, Zuckerberg sold a billion dollars in stock. His other $1.2 billion coming from perks like the use of the corporate jet and home security. GMI ranking the CEOs by total realized pay. That includes salary, bonus, and perks doled out in 2012, plus any gains from exercise stock options, stock sales, and increases in the value of a CEO's pension and deferred compensation. The second CEO to earn more than a billion dollars last year, Kinder Morgan's Richard Kinder. By converting over 30 million Class B shares into common stock, he netted $1.1 billion. Though Kinder says it wasn't all for him, Part of it went to a limited partnership. Mel Karmazin took the number three spot. Before leaving Sirius XM Radio, he exercised tens of millions of options, generating over $255 million in profits. Exercising 3.1 million options put Liberty Media's Greg Maffei in fourth place, the option grant given in 2009 resulting in a payoff of just under $255 million in 2012. But they took seventh place, too, earning $136 million from options linked to the other firm he oversees, Liberty Interactive. Rounding out the top five, Apple CEO Tim Cook, given a million restricted stock units when named to that post in 2011, most of the $143 million he took home in 2012 came from gains on stock grants given in 2008 and 2010. And as long as those gains keep coming, author Bruce Ellig sees little potential for investor outrage. If stock price is going up and dividends are going up, by and large shareholders are almost immune to the, what's happening to executive pay. And what's happening now is CEO pay keeps going higher. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson. Still ahead, why Netflix shares had such a wild and crazy day. But first, how the international markets perform today. day for Netflix and this chart tells the story. You can see that it popped after yesterday's earnings. Look at that little Matterhorn like rise there on a quadrupling of profits. But shares gave back those gains today trading at eight times their 50 day average volume with more than 17 million shares flipping. So why the incredible rise and then sharp decline all in just two trading days. Julia Borston has the story. 
Why did Netflix shares pull back dramatically after better than expected earnings? CEO Reed Hastings said this on the earnings call Monday. Every time I read a story about uh, Netflix is the um, highest appreciating stock in the S&P 500, uh, it worries me because that was the exact headline that we used to see in 2003. And, you know, you can definitely, uh, we have a sense of momentum investors driving the stock price. Despite the pullback, Netflix is still one of the best performing stocks in the S&P 500 this year, up about 250% so far in 2013. Supporting those gains by beating analysts' projections for the third quarter and issuing stronger than expected guidance for the rest of the year. Investments in exclusive content like Breaking Bad and Netflix original shows like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black are paying off. Pow! They're definitely coming out of the starting from scratch in original programming and doing a lot better than I think anyone expected. And that's a large part of why the stock is where it's at today. One of the most important numbers in Netflix's quarterly earnings are subscribers. The company added 1.3 million here at home and 1.4 million overseas, laying the groundwork for big plans for international expansion. After Netflix's huge run in the past year, its ongoing growth depends on a few other things. Whether the originals, it turns out, continue to be big hits, if it can secure more deals with cable companies to gain access to more U.S. homes, and how it manages content costs. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. And late today, hedge fund manager Carl Icahn disclosed that he lowered his stake in Netflix to four and a half percent about a year ago. He first, about a year ago, he first disclosed a 10 percent investment in the company. And for more on Netflix, CEO Reed Hastings' strategy for the company, head to our website, nbr.com. Meanwhile, investors are bracing for a disappointing earnings report from Caterpillar. The world's largest maker of construction and mining equipment releases the numbers tomorrow before the market open. But today, it said dealer sales figures for September were down 9 percent compared to the same month last year. One bright spot, though, equipment sales in North America rose for a second month in a row thanks to a pickup in infrastructure and housing construction projects. We begin market focus tonight with a late day earnings report from Amgen, the world's biggest biotech company. Third quarter profit beating estimates as sales of more than a half dozen of its drugs increased by double digits. The company, which makes arthritis and osteoporosis treatments, raised the lower end of its 2013 profit. Forecast shares finished the day higher by more than 2 percent, 116.21, the close there. An earnings beat for the Dow component DuPont helped by strong sales of solar panels. The company says increased demand for seeds and fertilizer ahead of the spring planting season will help drive profits higher in the current quarter. But revenues did come in a little shy of estimates, and that kept the gains tepid. At the close, shares up 1 percent to $60.17. Well, the fellow Dow Component Travelers uh, has a weak hurricane season to thank for its record operating profit. The insurance company has also been able to raise prices in some of its business lines, a strategy it intends to stick with, it says. The travelers also authorizing an additional $5 billion stock buyback. The stock finishing the day, though, fractionally lower to $86.71. Meantime, United Technologies, the third blue chipper to report earnings today, cut its full-year revenue outlook as third-quarter sales missed estimates. The world's largest maker of elevators and air conditioners said the U.S. government's sequestration program, which involves spending cuts on federal projects, is weighing on its defense business most especially. Shares fell more than 1 percent to 106.13. Whirlpool's bottom line being helped by the U.S. housing recovery and improved consumer sentiment in Europe. The world's top home appliance maker reported profits that more than doubled, and it raised its full-year earnings forecast. The stock swirled higher by 11.5 percent to $146 and change. Delta shares took off after a strong earnings report today. Fair hikes, along with strength in the U.S. and Europe, helped boost revenue and push earnings past analyst estimates. The airline also called its revenue revenue outlook, quote, solid through the end of the year. The stock gained more than 3 percent to $25.49. Coach is warning of continued weak sales in North America. That's its largest market. The luxury handbag maker posting a drop in third quarter revenue as it faces increased competition from rivals like Michael Kors and Kate Spade, something the CEO is fully aware of. We were late to respond to competition. 
and uh, the competition is doing extremely well. Mm. What the competition has done is changed the dynamics of the marketplace. It has really raised the importance of, of the emotional quotient and having a full head-to-toe look. And uh, that's what we're uh, doing here in North America. Despite that enthusiasm, the stock was one of the worst performing in the S&P today. It tumbled 7.5 percent to $50.10. And a tough day for Groupon, the stock sliding after an analyst warned of a drop in gross billings in North America, its strongest market. ITG Investment Research says September's numbers show a slowdown, and that follows a weak August. Groupon shares fell sharply, down about 7 percent, to close at $9.86. And bad news if you're hoping to get money back on your federal taxes as early as possible next year. Because of this month's partial government shutdown, the IRS now says that the start of 2014 tax filing season could be delayed for up to two weeks. The tax season was scheduled to begin on January 21st, but may now be pushed back as far as February 4th. A final decision on the start date for the filing season will be announced sometime in December. And no matter when it begins, the April 15th deadline for filing your returns remains the same. No way to escape that. Well, the Obama administration is also scrambling to meet another deadline, getting those online health exchanges up and running and on time. The Department of Health and Human Services has called on Verizon now to fix the problem. It makes sense to bring in Verizon. Its Division for Enterprise Solutions already does contract information work for the HHS and for Medicare as well. Meantime, Consumer Reports has a blunt message for anyone interested in using the healthcare.gov website. Stay away. The magazine suggests that people looking to shop for a new health plan avoid the federal online marketplace for another month, giving the government enough time to work out the problems that have besieged its rollout from day one. Coming up on the program, Apple wasn't the only company to unveil a new tablet today. So did Microsoft and Nokia. But can these other tablets chip away at the iPad's lead? But first, let's take a look at how commodities, treasuries, and currencies perform today. Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates is making a big bet on a turnaround in Spain. Through one of the investment funds he controls, Gates is paying $155 million for a 6% stake in a Spanish construction company called Fomento de Construcciones y Contratas, making him the company's second largest stakeholder, if he can pronounce it. This follows significant investments in other Spanish-based companies over the past year by fellow billionaires Warren Buffett and Mexico's Carlos Slim. And a big day for tablets. Apple, Microsoft, and Nokia all unveiling a new device today, just in time for the upcoming holiday shopping season. Microsoft updated its line of Surface tablets, but it was Apple that grabbed most of the headlines today, rolling out some updated versions of its top-selling iPads. John Fort has more from Silicon Valley. It's a wrestling match now in the tablet market. Apple, the heavyweight in the category, out today with a new lineup of iPads. What's new? The full-size iPad gets a new name. It's now the iPad Air, 30% lighter than the previous version. The iPad Mini gets a major upgrade, a Retina display, the latest A7 and M7 chips, and a slightly higher price tag. This time around, the story's not just about the speeds and feeds or even the dimensions of the iPads themselves. It's about how Apple has expanded the product line for the iPad. Now you can get Retina versions of both the iPad Mini and the full-size iPad. And if you don't want Retina, you can just pay $100 less. Heading into the crucial holiday season, the new iPads will square off against more affordable tablets from Amazon and Google and renewed efforts from Nokia and Microsoft. I just need a full computer, so that's why I went for the Surface Pro. So it's not just a tablet uh, where you're bound to some app store, it's, it's a full PC basically. I bought it because it has uh, the digitizer pen, but uh, Apple, Apple uh, doesn't have any of these pens or kind of devices. The reason they're giving stuff away free is that's the kind of the new battlefront is around the hosted, the web applications. That's something that Google does really well. 
And what Apple's essentially trying to do is make that, that, that value, take that away from Google and really empower their people to have this good ecosystem. So this really was a shot towards Google and a lot of the free stuff that they give away. Investors are likely wondering what it all means for holiday quarter sales and margins. It'll be the first time we've had a holiday season tablet launch with a full year of pent up demand. So the difference could be significant. New iPads, lots of free software. We'll see this holiday season whether it's enough to fend off the competition. For Nightly Business Report, I'm John Fort. And finally tonight, with the World Series starting Wednesday night, one lucky baseball fan has already snagged the deal of a lifetime, a ticket to game one in Boston for just $6. The fan spotted the $3 ticket on StubHub, the secondary market vendor, paid the $3 service fee, and will be sitting in right field of Fenway Park tomorrow night for less than the cost of a Fenway Frank. The price does appear to be a mistake, but there's been no official word from the seller. Meantime, the latest data from another secondary ticket marketing site, TickIQ, shows just how lucky that fan is. Average ticket prices are over $1,500 at Fenway Park in Boston. In St. Louis, they're cheaper, $962 on average. Both towns crazy for baseball. I've got a deal for you. Just come over to my house. Best seat in the house. Free. And I can watch? Yes, you popcorn. Hot dogs. Cracker. Yes, Maybe anything some beverages, you want, the whole Tyler. thing. All right, Susie. <laughs> That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrett. For more on the stories we covered, go to our website, nbr.com. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you by TheStreet.com. Interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. We are TheStreet.com. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. September's job report showed that only 148,000 jobs were created last month, far fewer than expected. The unemployment rate fell to 7.2 percent. On Wall Street, investors are hoping the Federal Reserve will hold off on trimming its stimulus program. That meant stocks rose sharply higher, with the S&P 500 setting another all-time closing high. The Dow added 76 points, the Nasdaq touching another 13-year high, adding nine points on the day, and the S&P up 10. Points. Shares of Netflix plunged 9% today on some profit taking, despite profits quadrupling last quarter. And Nokia, Microsoft, and Apple all releasing brand new tablet computers. Apple says the new iPad Air is eight times faster than the original. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.